that when you have these organisms in biofilms, right, so one of the problems there is you can have exchange, you can have plasmids, you know, with these antibiotic res resistant genes uh, on them, they can be transferred to uh, other bacteria within the biofilm, so we can actually spread the antibiotic resistance, you know, within that community, and that ends up becoming a problem. And so, um, you know, we also have, you know, bacteriophage, we talked about them, so you know we can have the phage also do the same thing. And so, um, you know, one of the things that uh, you know, might have been mentioned in one of the other classes you've taken recently is also transposons. So, you know, besides the plasmids, the bacteriophage, you can also have you know these uh, mobile genetic element transposons that can do the same thing. And so, we have you know these uh, means of being able to spread um, you know resistance within. Uh, the biofilms, and so we already know that you know getting into the center of the biofilm is difficult enough because you know uh, within that core, you know you have um, you know the organisms within there, um, you know, the highly anaerobic organisms, you know being able to influence uh, the way in which you have um, you know, organisms coming into the periphery of the biofilms, you know how they would behave if they're actually able to even exist uh, within uh, within that periphery. So uh, antibiotic resistance is something that's important to uh, try to understand. And so we mentioned the beta-lactam ring, and we said that this was present on the penicillins. Everybody can remember this. You know, you had a semi-synthetic penicillins also incorporating the beta-lactam ring. And so uh, this we need to um, know. So uh, you know, to resist the beta-lactam, right, organisms can do a number of things. So one, we can have you know, the plasmids. Um, you know, so they can, they can you know, encode genes that uh, will produce um, the enzymes that can you know, facilitate the breakdown of this ring. And we can also have alteration of penicillin binding uh, proteins, right? So again, you know, no longer able to bind to the penicillin, in which case we can't have their effects uh, realized on the bacteria. And we can you know, reduce uh, membrane permeability. So in this case, we're reducing drug access. And then also, we can uh, have you know, uh, efflux uh, you know, of the drug. So you know, again, different ways in which we can have this happen. This just shows you um, an example of the R plasmid. And so you know, within that, you can have you know, the beta-lactamase gene okay, that's present uh, over there. And other, you know, genes encoding uh, molecules that can act on, you know, the other aspects that we saw. So again, efflux uh, pump genes. Uh, we have a dihydrofolic reductase, you know, gene that's been modified over here, and then we have one for the pentacol transferase, you know, uh, uh, that's also here. So a number of different things that can be on a plasmid that can be used by the bacteria to resist uh, the drug that will work to them. And so this just kind of shows you that way, you know, you're not going to be asked this part. Okay, we're just more concerned about remembering the four ways. But it just kind of shows you what happens, you know, where if you have the polyphenicol, if we have the polyphenicol acetyl transferase uh, generated uh, in terms of acetyl way, we can end up with this inactive, you know, drug that no longer has any effect on the, uh, on the bacteria. And so we uh, have um, other uh, mechanisms. And so, again, you know, uh, the sulfonamides, um, you know, we can have the presence of the hydrocatroid uh, synthetase that, you know, can go after these drugs. And so, you know, the enzyme will be inhibited by the sulfonamides. And, you know, in this case, you know, these will be uh, acting as a competitive inhibitor for the paraminobenzoic acid, which we mentioned before, is, you know, is needed for um, you know, for uh, the synthesizing, you know, the nucleotides, you know, the DNA synthesis and all of that. And so many of the organisms, you know, uh, have to essentially salvage the purines from the environment. And so if you have this in there, you know, um, you can block that aspect of things. And so in that case, you know, if the cells cannot de novo, uh, you know, have all the components necessary to do the synthesis, then that will be the, the thing that affects them. But if they can, you know, have this inhibited, then you know uh, they're still able to continue to live and survive and continue to uh, scavenge uh, for these uh, molecules, you know, from the environment. And so um, again, if we do, you know, any kind of modification to the active sites, right, um, that can also 
lead to the generation of resistance uh, you know, in the organisms. So again, just showing different ways that this can happen. And so um, bacteria multiply very fast. So when we looked at the growth of cells, we said that we can have growth to your cell uh, division, right, in as little as 15 minutes, right, we're doubling. Okay, so, you know, um, for most, you know, cells, E. coli, when we say 15 minutes, we're really thinking in our minds about E. coli. But then if we looked at, you know, even other gram-positive uh, cells, they were within a 20 minute, 30 minute, you know, kind of a doubling time. And then for some of the slow growers, you know, then, you know, we're above that going to about maybe 45 minutes an hour. But typically, you know, the general types of bacteria that we would encounter, um, you know, in the oral cavity, the ones that, you know, can be cultured and things like this, Multiplication time, you know, is pretty fast, okay? And so we can increase uh, num you know, in numbers very quickly. And so um, what can also happen as we have cells dividing, okay, um, you know, within the, uh, you know, the oral um, um, microbiome, right? We can have uh, the cells uh, adapt to a variety of drug selective uh, pressures. So we gave the example of, you know, um, one of the problems that we have with resistance, you know, to a whole group of antibiotics has to do with the fact that we have antibiotics practically everywhere. So, you know, besides having individuals being prescribed antibiotics, you know, uh, for situations where they may not need them, uh, as, you know, for example, in, you know, people have colds and it's viral in nature, antibiotics being prescribed in that case is really not useful. But then we also have antibiotics, you know, within the food system. So we have antibiotics, you know, that are used for treatment, you know, of, uh, of uh, animals in agriculture. And so we have that, you know, just a pool of antibiotics being present. And then, of course, individuals who uh, prescribe, you know, courses of antibiotics, we don't finish them. So, you know, they start taking them, they begin to feel, you know, better, and then, you know, they don't finish the course of the treatment. And this gives um, you know an opportunity for the organisms you know to now uh, you know adapt to this new environment you know and then begin to resist the effects of the drug. And so when we have um, this kind of adaptation occurring as a result of uh, you know a drug pressure, a number of things can happen. So we can have you know uh, random mutations that occur, um, and we can have recombination events that take place you know uh, within uh, the DNA of the uh, bacteria. Uh, we can also have, you know, uh, lateral gene transfer or horizontal gene transfer where we have, you know, um, the genes being transferred, you know, uh, amongst organisms, right? And so the interesting thing about this when you have um, selection in this way is that, you know, some, some of the mutations may not actually have any effect on the drugs, but some will, as we'll see. Um, and depending on what happens with the recombination and what site, you know, where the recombination takes place, it may or may not have any effect, you know, on the, on the drugs. And as well, you know, depending on what aspect of the genes are being transferred, <coughs> excuse me, laterally, you know, they may also not have any effect. But then, you know, you have this occurring at such, you know, uh, you know high rates that, you know, uh, you begin to have an increased, you know, probability that you're going to actually have um, you know, genes that would be um, important in resistance, you know, being uh, made available. And so, uh, you know, this last point over here, if we have, you know, uh, the drug, you know, present, so the pressure of the drug, you know, is being uh, maintained, right, within the pool of organisms, the population of organisms that are receiving this pressure, if you will, you will have some, you know, that will, you know, uh, have the mutations that eventually will actually uh, confer resistance to the drugs uh, that are there. And so what will happen is that when that occurs, and if the pressure is, you know, kind of removed, then those organisms, you know, can actually take over, okay? And they will begin to grow, um, you know, and you have that resistance uh, present. And so we kind of want to look at this right here. Okay, and so uh, this kind of shows what can happen. And so here we have the population of uh, uh, cells, right, before the treatment. 
And so, you know, the way kind of to look at what's going on in here, you know, with this key, so the yellows, you know, low resistance all the way, you know, to the more a darker red, you know, being the highly resistant uh, group of organisms. So when things start out, okay, you know, so we have this kind of continuum in here, and then as we begin to apply the treatment, okay, we see that, you know, we can actually uh, have effect, you know, uh, actually target and eliminate organisms, uh, give the immune system, you know, a chance, you know, to develop, you know, uh, from innate responses to acquired, you know, responses, have antibodies made, have, you know, um, uh, uh, cells activated, T, uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells made, and so on, and to really go after the organisms, you know, for elimination. But then, you know, we can also have the situation where we have the drug treatment and, you know, we don't see, you know, the effects of the immune system, you know, really working. We're not eliminating the organisms, but then we begin to uh, select organisms in here that are of uh, intermediate resistance. Uh, there will be additional genetic changes within those cells. And then, you know, as they progress and continue to divide, they get to the point where essentially, you know, they're not even responding to the drugs anymore. And then, you know, in the situation where individuals, you know, begin a course of treatment, you know, they don't finish it, you know, so they prematurely stop the treatment. What can then begin to happen is that, again, those organisms, you know, that are intermediately resistant, you know, undergo additional genetic changes, and then, you know, we'll end up with, you know, very highly resistant uh, populations, you know. So, again, in these two groups, we see that happen. And so, if you look uh, down here to see what's going on, right, so you have this synergistic effect that's going on between the immune system and, you know, the, uh, the presence of the drugs, you know, affecting those cells and being able to get to the point, you know, where we can actually eliminate uh, the organisms. But then if you look over here, you know, in these two, you know, which represent B and C right here, right, um, so you don't have any immune clearance, right, um, you know, you begin to get the resistant organisms. Over here, you know, just the amount that was present, you know, when the individual was taking the drugs, um, as soon as they stop, those organisms were already beginning to develop resistance, we just continue that, and you will have, you know, in both cases, this, you know, very, um, you know, uh, resistant population of cells. And so, in this middle one, um, you know, we can have a situation where, you know, the the reason why we're not clearing is because the individuals are immunocompromised for a whole variety of reasons. And so, you know, in in there, we could include, you know, um, you know, uh, compromised individuals. It could be in the immune system. <coughs> It could be in the acquired system, you know, it could be due to, um, you know, having a particular, you know, cell types, you know, not available or not functional. It could be everything from, uh, you know, neutrophils to natural killer cells, you know, to you know, T cells, B cells, where you have the problem. And so, you know, in that case, you know, uh, whether it's acquired, you know, um, immunosuppression or, you know, something that's developmental, congenital, doesn't matter, you know, uh, the potential is there, okay, you know, to see the same effect. And so when um, we've mentioned the fact that, you know, for most things that we've talked about, right, so we've talked about uh, caries, the different types and so on, when we talk about peritonitis, you know, the different types and so on, we found that, you know, um, antibodies are not necessarily prescribed, you know, right away, right, everybody kind of gets that. So, you know, the mean, you know, the whole idea, okay, let's reduce the number of bacteria there and potentially get, you know, the pathogenic ones, you know, have their numbers also reduced will be the thing. But then when you begin to have invasion into tissue, you're beginning to have, you know, abscesses form, um, you're beginning to uh, have, you know, bone loss and this type of a thing. Then those situations, you know, begin to demand that there, you know, that there might be a need to uh, have antibiotic treatments, you know, uh, started. And so then the question that does become, okay, you know, with all the discussions that here about antibiotic resistance, right, you know, what is it that can be now used? And then we also discuss the fact that, you know, it's not every single case um, where, you know, bacteria have to be isolated and cultured and you know, the various metabolic tests done, you know, to identify, you know, what kind of organism you have, right? But in some cases, 
just being able to know from material obtained, you know, from the lesions and so on, uh, just, you know, gram stain to be able to say, okay, you know, my seed predominantly gram, stain, gram negative, gram positive, you know, in those situations might actually be useful so that the correct antibiotics, you know, are given either something that's broad enough to go after gram positive and gram negative, or if we're predominantly gram negative or gram you know, positive, to also make the appropriate decision for <coughs> the correct um, antibiotics to be given. So um, when we're looking at um, antimicrobial drug uh, resistance, right, just like we saw in the example with the uh, penicillins, so the semi-synthetic ones, they can incorporate other chemistry besides the beta, the beta lactam ring, so that if the organisms do have a beta lactamase, and if they can break the ring, then the, the additional chemistry available can still target something besides the cell wall, okay? And so, uh, you know, what can also happen is you can actually uh, have synergistic, um, you know, uh, provision of the antimicrobial agents. And so the idea uh, is we're not looking for having the antimicrobial agent do the whole job. Okay, so the idea is you want to have the immune system also properly activated, okay, to help with the elimination. And so in order to um, make sure that what's being prescribed, what's being taken, has the potential to eliminate, you know, large uh, numbers of those uh, cells, right, you have to know what levels are appropriate. And so when drugs are tested, okay, for their effectiveness and so on, um, you know, Number one, the effectiveness of the drug, you know, has to be established. Number two, you don't want the concentration or the level or the amount of the drug that you use to also uh, have toxic effects on the, on the host. And so we have the minimum inhibitory concentration that's established and the minimum lethal concentration that's also established. And so the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, right, is the lowest amount of the drug needed to inhibit replication of the microbe. And then, you know, the MLC is the lowest amount of a drug needed to kill a microbe. So we need to know these two, these two things. So when we talked about ant uh, antiseptics and disinfectants, right, we also mentioned there that for every one of those, you know, that's, um, you know, that, that's uh, established, right? You know, before they're ever put into you know, general use, right? We have to make sure that we know if the antiseptic is going to kill broadly all gram positive, all gram negative, and in some cases maybe even, you know, bonus, you know, kill fungi and eukaryotes and, and things like that, right? But at minimum, you know, do we know if we're killing, you know, both gram positive, gram negative, uh, we also able to target, you know, those organisms, you know, uh, without the cell walls, things like mycoplasma and, you know, rickettsia and things like this. So we need to know that. And so, um, you know, part of the way that that's done is to use phenol as the reference point. So in other words, are we as good as phenol? Are we better than phenol? Are we worse than phenol? And so that's like the, you know, the, you know, the standard. And then everything goes up or down from there, right? And so same idea, when we have the, you know, the antibiotics, we also need to know, uh, you know, at what levels, you know, we're inhibiting replication and what levels are we actually killing. And although not mentioned directly here, again, are we killing or inhibiting broadly gram-positive, gram-negative, or is it just only gram-positive, only gram-negative? Okay, so those things, you know, become really important. So again, uh, you know, susceptibility testing, you know, is what, you know, we have these two uh, under. So the MIC and the MLC. So we need to recognize those. And so we have a number of different ways of doing this. One of the most common ways that's done is uh, by using the Kirby Bauer the disc the diffusion test. How many people are familiar with this? Heard of it, seen it, okay, right? And so, you know, I mean, these can be made, um, you know, in the lab, you know, so just for, for use. But, you know, we have them commercially available where, you know, you buy these discs that have, you know, um, you know that have the uh, drugs essentially impregnated in them. And so what you do is you grow up the bacteria in a lawn of cells, and then you put the discs on the plate, 
incubate them, and then you look for growth. And so you're looking to see if in the areas, you know, immediately surrounding the disc, do you see cell growth up to the disc, or do you see areas of inhibition? So those areas where you don't see any cells growing, they're the ones that are referred to as the zones of inhibition, okay? And you can measure the diameter of the zones to get an idea of, you know, the most effective, you know, drug. And if you're looking at the same drug with different concentrations, you can also get a sense of, you know, the concentration that gives you, you know, the widest zone uh, of uh, killing, okay? And then, you know, so there are other tests, you know, that have been developed, you know, um, compared to the Kirby Bauer disk test. And, you know, th this is not even the whole list, you know, there are a whole bunch of other ones. And so we have the Slometer uh, test or E-test. Uh, we have the additional subunit test. They're all doing the same thing. There are ones that you can actually do um, in micro tidal plates, which is what you see at the bottom over there with the green wells. And that allows you to screen, you know, large numbers. Okay, so if this is done in a 96 well plate, right, you know, so you have 96 wells for which you can actually design, you know, the inhibition test and you can you know, screen with different you know, uh, drugs, with different dilutions, you know, concentrations, and things of that nature. And then it gives you a good sense you know, of what you're dealing with. And so again, whether you're doing the E-test, whether you're doing the, um, the uh, uh, dilution stability test, so again, here you would have you know, read the OD, so remember, the more turbid you know, the solution is, the more cells you have, right, the less turbid, you know, uh, you have, right, the less growth you have. And so if you have products, you know, that you're looking for, right, again, you know, the intensity will, you know, will match how much cells you have in there. The more cells you have, the more intense, the less cells you have, and so on. So there are many different ways, you know, uh, of doing this. So again, when you look in here, right, um, you know, if you have, you know, clear, no turbidity, you, know, you have, you know, inhibition, right, if you can see, you know, cloudy wells, you know, then that tells you you have growth and so on, and of course you're gonna set negative and positive controls you know, within the plate so that you know, the interpretation of the data will make sense. And so back up over here, when you look at that, okay, so in this particular example, right, practically you know, each one of these, you, know, um, you see a zone of inhibition, and you can see in the examples over here where you have you know, the largest zones um, on the plate, okay? So again, this is you know, um, uh, a way of being able to establish this kind of a thing. And then in the table over here, right, you see the concentration of the drugs we have in the disk. Right? And then you, know, you can uh, uh, measure the, uh, the zones, right? uh, everything from you know, those that are very highly susceptible to those that are resistant, but you know, the zones are still small. So we need to remember the Kirby Bauer diff diffusion test. Okay, you know, we need to remember the E-test, you know, which is what we're seeing, right? And uh, we need to remember, you know, the ability to use the dilution submarine test, you know, on these micro wells to be able to determine, um, you know, resistance, you know, to, uh, to the drugs. Can you explain just what's the difference between the different tests? So the one on the bottom, that... Right, so, so, so they, they're, all, they're all the same thing, they're just designed differently. Right, so this is the oldest one, the Kirby Bauer is like the one that's been around, you know, for the longest time. Um, so again, the idea is the same, so uh, either you have the drugs on the little discs, the little round discs, or you have like strips, you know, and, or you're doing the same thing, you're putting them on the plate. And then you, you know, you, you have a lawn of cells, and you put them on there, and then you're looking to see growth. Right, and so the idea is okay. You know, do I see growth regardless, you know, of having these things on there, or am I going to see that I have growth limited, you know, uh, around the strips or the discs? And then the question is, you know, how how much inhibition am I seeing? Right, which is you know now described by the size, the diameter of the zone of inhibition. Okay, and then around the strips, same thing. Okay, and in some examples, you know, you would have like a control. You know, which you know is probably what this is over here, where you know, okay, you know, you see that you know um, growth still continues up onto the strip, and so on. And then you know, in, in the in, in the controls where you have the discs, you would have a disc, and you would see that the bacteria were growing right up to the edge of the disc, 
So if that were the case, then you know there's no inhibition because the cells are growing right up to you know where the drug is, and there's no effect. Yeah. Okay. And then down here, right? You're still looking for growth or no growth, but you're in solution. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? So in the first two over there, you're on plates. Remember how we looked at the agar plates, right? So you streak on the plate and then you drop your discs on there. Okay? So you can also do a similar thing in solution, okay, where you have the bacteria in you know, the solution and you know you have the drug available and if there is no growth, you will not have turbidity. There will be no cloudiness. Okay? If you have growth, you're gonna have turbidity. Okay? And so when you read the OD, right, you know, you're going to uh, be able to have more absorbance when you have more cells. Go ahead. Do you detect uh, OD on just the dilution susceptibility Right. So OD only when you have things growing in uh, liquid. Okay. So remember how we looked at the uh, growing of the cells, right? And we mentioned we can grow cells on solid media, semi-solid, liquid, right? And so when we, uh, when we had discussed, you know, uh, enumeration of the cells, we said that on the plate, you know, so if you did your dilutions and you did a pore plate, right, you would see colonies. So what's, what's a countable plate? Anybody know what a countable plate is? <coughs> How many colonies, you know, gives you a countable plate? What did we say? Countable plate. Who remembers that? Was it 30 to 300? 30 to 300, right? Okay, everybody can remember that? Right, okay. And so if you had, you know, um, if you, after doing the plating, and if you had, you know, a lot of cells, you know, a lot of colonies, where you couldn't even, if you tried to count them, you probably count, you know, one colony like four or five times, right? Then those were plates that had too many to count, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so those are important to remember because, again, you know, it's a kind of a thing. And I, I keep coming back to this same thing because, you know, every, every now and then I'll have somebody ask me you know, from this same uh, class, right, you know, so, um, you know, if somebody comes in and they have a lot of plaque, you know, things look really bad, you know, should they be really thinking about trying to <laughs> get stuff? And it's like, you know, no. I mean, not, you know, most, you know, regular practices don't have, you know, um, plates and incubators and stuff like this for growing, you know, for growing cells, right? But sometimes stuff can be bad enough that they may, you know, obtain, you know, the growth media and things like this. Um, tubes, there are all manner of ways of collecting samples, you know, we have transport tubes, you know, they're, they're pretty um, uh, small and manageable, and they can be sent to reference lab. So you can get the material, and you can send it to the reference lab, and they will do the growing they will get the results back. And if it's something really strange, you know, going on, then, you know, you're going to want to have some additional things done. So my final question is then, with the uh, curry bar diffusion test versus the E test, is the main difference the strips versus the test? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they're mm -hmm. just different, the same, te same testing, but just different ways presented. Okay, so it's yeah. just strips versus the test. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the Kirby Bauer, like I said, you know, I mean, um, if people do nothing else, say they don't do the dilution test, they don't do the E-test, whatever, the Kirby Bauer would be like the most common one that they would do. So if you, if you have students, you know, in the lab, um, you know, uh, when they're learning about antimicrobial resistance and they have to set up, you know, the exercise to be able to see, right, um, that's the most common one that's going to be done. Okay, does that make sense? Right. Okay. Okay. And so um, we could have some other things uh, happen. So you know, if we have you know intrinsic drug resistance, you know, due uh, bless you, due to natural structure, you know, or metabolism of the organism, it may be a situation you know where um, you know. There's a lack of access to the target, you know, a molecule. Um, and again, when, when you see that, think the gram-negative cells with the periplasmic space, right, and that outer membrane. So you kind of visualize that whole thing, right? Um, you know, you may also have your know, side effects of uh, function. So, you know, um, bacteria have E. 
reflux pumps, you know, just like you know fungi would do. So it would be an effect of that. Um, you could also have, you know, uh, within the environment, and although, and again, when we say within the environment, we're thinking even within the biofilms, okay, in those populations. So one of the ways in which you know organisms, you know, can keep others away is by themselves secreting antimicrobial agents for within the population. Does that make sense? Right? So they can keep away other bacteria by producing these uh, substances. Okay? And so when you're looking, you know, in the environment, you know, um, where you have populations of, you know, eukaryotic, you know, fungal bacteria growing together, you might find that the fungi are producing, um, you know, uh, substances that keep bacteria growth away. Right? So which is how we found, you know, the, this whole uh, the history that we have of the of antibiotics, the discovery, you know, by Fleming of the penicillin, right? So you can have, you know, the fungi doing this, you can have, um, you know, eukaryotic organisms, you know, protists, you know, in the environment also producing things to keep bacteria away from them, right? And so all of that can happen. So if you have, you know, one microbe in a complex, okay, microbial ecosystem secreting a natural antibiotic compound, it can provide a selective pressure on the other microbes. And so the whole idea, the big interest in um, trying to identify and discover new antibiotics relies on what we just said, okay? So that you know, there might be you know, uh, natural antibiotics in the environment being produced by cells you know, within the microbiome, within the oral, uh, 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 microbiomes, where you have antibiotics being produced and essentially just awaiting you know, discovery. Okay, so that's always something to keep in mind. And so, uh, you know, in this case, right, when you have the antimicrobial agents being produced naturally and it's being selected for other organisms, right, there's no human intervention there. Okay, so that's just going on within the population. And so the benefit and advantage that would be there for human intervention would be to find out, you know, what uh, those uh, agents are. And, you know, and see that they might actually be useful, um, you know, for larger groups of organisms. So there's always, you know, again, a need. Um, and it's an intense area of research where people continue to look, you know, to find, you know, in the soil, you know, in the water, you know, within the human body, I mean, you name it, looking for organisms producing um, antibiotics naturally that we don't know about. You know, to see if we can actually uh, have those become useful since there's so much of, of problems with the multiple resistant uh, 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 strains that we have out there. All right, so we see the things that we've already kind of mentioned. So again, you know, with uh, widespread use of the, of the drug, in this case with penicillin, you know, we saw, um, you know, how the resistance started to uh, develop. And like I said, this is not something that's unique to bacteria. We can say the same thing about, you know, uh, plasmodium, you know, falciparum with chloroquine use, you know, and the huge resistance that developed to, uh, uh, to the drug. And again, because you had such widespread use of the thing. And some of the same things we've mentioned, people not finishing courses of treatment, people using, you know, any fever, you know, was malaria, therefore we took the anti-malaria. And all of a sudden, you know, you saw this resistance that to pop Same thing we could say with, you know, with the uh, natural penicillin, penicillin G. And then, so again, you know, um, there are different mechanisms, you know, that are used, and we've seen some examples. But, you know, we can have, you know, modification of pre-existing genes. Um, you know, we can have spontaneous mutations that occur. Um, we can develop, you know, um, new uh, mutations, you know, from uh, exposure to uh, mutagens. And as well, we can have you know, resistance through the things that we've talked about. And, and this we need to remember. So we've mentioned you know, the phages, you know, bacterial phage, transducing phages. We mentioned uh, plasmids, you know, they can transfer uh, genes. We can have recombination events. And then we also mentioned the transposons, you know, the mobile you know, uh, transposable mm -hmm. elements. Any of these can move genes you know, um, 
you know, you know, between and amongst organisms. Okay, and especially you know within these biofilms, we have you know huge populations of cells, and you can have you know the resistance being conferred now, you know, on organisms that didn't uh, have that before. So essentially, when that happens, you know, um, you know, you have the generation of new strains. Okay, that are now resistant to uh, to the drug. And so this over here just kind of shows you the ways in which um, you know we can have. Uh, new genetic material, you know, acquired, you know, uh, between and amongst uh, bacterial cells. So we have the first one, conjugation. So we have, you know, the replicating uh, plasmid, right, with the resistance gene from one cell, okay, to another, okay. So we can have that uh, coming, and so most times we'll have, you know, a uh, sex pillus, you know, available for this. So when we mentioned the pili, right? So we had, you know, we distinguished between the pili that are used for, you know, conjugation in this way, as well as the pili that are used, you know, for adherence. Okay, everybody kind of remember that, okay? And so we can have that happen, or we can have, you know, transduction. Okay, in this case, when you hear transduction or you read transduction, you're thinking page. Okay. So again, here, you know, we can have. The um, you know the gene you know that encodes the resistant uh, protein, uh, we have that gene integrated you know into the host uh, chromosome, and then when that happens, right, when we get infected, and if we have the fake uh, DNA integrated, when they come back out, they can take a portion of that gene with them, and then they can move it into uh, into new cells. And so it's the same kind of a thing, you know, can happen, uh, you know, even, you know, from the plasmids. We can also acquire those genes and we can transfer them that way when we have the phase move from one host cell to another. And then we can have, you know, uh, transposition that can occur, right? So in, in this case, we have the transposons or the mobile uh, genetic elements. And so we can have the resistance gene, you know, uh, from there. And then we can have them, you know, uh, transpose out of the bacterial chromosome, or we can have it even from the plasmids that we have in the bacteria. And then, you know, the last example here is recombination, where again, we can have uh, the recombination take place, you know, between, uh, you know, plasmid and the bacterial chromosome. We can move a, a segment or a portion of the, of, the, of the gene, or sometimes the entire thing. And then when we combine, we have that now in the bacterial uh, DNA. And so then now the ability to encode for that protein, enzyme, whatever it happens to be, is now present in the bacteria. And so any one of these ways, right, can be used to move um, you know, the DNA around and by doing so, move the resistance, you know, to the drug as well, okay? So again, conjugation, transduction, Transposition, and so here we're thinking, you know, transposons, and then uh, recombination. All right, so um, you know, one of the things you know that people who work in this area are most interested about, you know, is uh, you know how quickly does this thing develop? Okay, so you know, you have a drug out, it's being used, and then all of a sudden you start to notice that it no longer has the effect. You might have to prescribe you know, stronger uh, doses, and even after a while, even the stronger doses don't really do anything to the bacteria. And so people, you know, will look for these things. And so, uh, you know, in some cases, you know, uh, it's very, you know, fairly quick in the scheme of things, um, you know, four to five years. And so again, in that case, you know, people are looking to see, okay, why is this happening so fast? And so the mechanisms we've just talked about, okay, aid that process. Okay, and so, you know, sometimes, you know, one or more of those may be occurring and, you know, it kind of, you know, hastens, you know, the appearance of these, uh, of these resistant, um, uh, resistant uh, genes present. And so you can have, you know, things like, you know, transfer of the whole resistant genes, right, by the you know, transposons, etc., plasmids, high frequency of, of random mutations occurring, recombination, the short generation times, right, so again, you know, that's a big factor, okay? So the more the organisms, you know, uh, multiplying, right, you know, the level of those mutations being, you know, uh, realized, you know, tend to kind of go, uh, go up. 
And so, you know, as we already discussed, you know, today and even previously, right, this is an ever, you know, um, important area. Um, not just for bacteria, but for viruses, for parasites, and so on, okay? New drugs, new drugs, you know. Can we stay steps ahead of the organisms, you know, being able to mutate and become resistant to these things? And we extend this even beyond. I mean, you know, so in cases, you know, where you have, you know, arthropods, you know, that are transmitting uh, organisms, you know, you have them being resistant to insecticides and all whatnot, and you have to kind of go after that as well. So this is an ongoing problem, okay, and a very important one, you know, in uh, practice because you want to make sure that when you, when you prescribe drugs and you're trying to treat, that they're going to be effective. And, you know, if they're not, and you have, you know, uh, things happening, like we mentioned the Canada Ori situation, which is quite scary, right, then it's, you know, um, it's just very challenging and I can make, you know, uh, managing patients quite difficult. All right, and so we've already mentioned the business, you know, with the, uh, with the agriculture and the farm animals, you know, with all the antibodies and all of that. And so, you know, this, this is a, a huge problem. And so again, you know, as much as we're thinking about it, you know, for uh, human use and patients and so on, right, there's also uh, a lot of interest in, um, you know, in agriculture to find different ways, you know, of raising uh, the animals and so on without the huge amounts of uh, drugs that are uh, being uh, used. Um, you know, again, you, know, you see this over here, you know, if you have, the less organisms you have bothering the animals, right, um, you know, the more they increase in size and weight and the healthier, larger, then you know, there's more profit. So this is a cycle, you know, that's ongoing that, um, you know, uh, people are working in all the different avenues. So, um, you know, again, there's, you know, a lot of discussion about the, the business of overuse. And these days, you know, things are a little better. If people have, you know, uh, illnesses of viral origin, you know, most physicians, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, forthcoming and be able to say no, you know, we're not going to prescribe the antibiotics and have other ways of managing that particular infection. Um, and, you know, so that this will re re kind of reduce the amount that's out there uh, for use. So a lot of things to kind of consider. And so how do we um, deal with drug resistance, right? So again, reduced use is one. Okay, selective drugs, okay, making sure, so if, again, back to the question of, you know, do I have to plate things out, do I have to grow these things and so on, right, selective use of drugs is important. If, you know, if the issue is a gram-positive thing, then let's be using something that's targeting gram-positive cells and not one that's, you know, also, you know, going after gram-negatives who are not involved in the infection that's ongoing, right? So selective use of the drugs, being able to use, you know, multi-drug cocktails makes it a little more uh, tough for the organisms, you know, to resist that combination, you know, uh, together. Um, you know, effective infection control, so again, prevention, in cases where prevention can actually uh, yield, um, you know, good, nice positive results, then maybe go after that avenue instead of, you know, doing the treating. And then, you know, um, new vaccines, improved access, etc. alternatives, you know, all of these things, you know, are being aimed at ways to combat the resistance um, that develops. And so, you know, for the, the, the things that you're going to be doing, you know, down the road, etc., you know, the thing is to kind of think about the approaches, right, and, you know, how, you know, would you implement them, what are the benefits, and so again, if something can be prevented, you want to go after that route, you know, in the long run, it may end up being cheaper, um, you know, and so on. And so the thing is, you know, to make that decision, okay, you know, to decide uh, when to do that particular thing. So one of the things um, that uh, we've already talked about, right, so we said when we have bacteria in uh, populations, in microbiome, in biofilms, then we're also thinking that their phage, right, would be in the same place. Does that make sense? Right? And so um, if we have bacteriophage, that can target bacteria, and they infect the bacteria, and lice 
you know, the bacteria, right? Then, you know, we kill the bacteria, eliminate, okay? So phage therapy was something that was used for a while, and it kind of went out of use in other parts of the world, you know, people still, you know, uh, kept doing it. And now, because of the multi-drug resistance, you know, that we talked about, you know, the methicillin resistance, you know, staph, et cetera, people are wanting to go back to some of those things. And so the idea is, as shown here, you have a situation, you know, with the you know, infection, you had the phage that could target the bacteria in there. And so this is the you know, initial uh, situation before the phage treatment. And this is, you know, after, you know, uh, treatment had already started. So you have the phage treatment, you know, ongoing. And so again, you can see the resolution, you know, when compared. So again, the idea is, the phage is specific for the bacteria. You have the bacteria in the infection site. You have the phage present there. They will target the bacteria. They will kill the bacteria. And then, you know, you can resolve the infection as a result of that. And so, you know, there's a lot of interest in, in this now. Because again, you know, we have all the difficulties we've seen. So we've mentioned a few things, right? We mentioned the methicillin, you know, resistant, you know, uh, Staff, we mentioned the Clostridium difficile, which you know, in hospitals is a problem. We mentioned the Candida auris, you know, the yeast, you know, is the problem, and there are you know, others. So you're dealing with staphylococcal type infections, strep type infections, and so on. And so the thing is, okay, you know, if, uh, if you have a situation where it's possible, you know, could you apply this kind of uh, therapy, you know, phage therapy to them? And you know, it's worked in the past. You know, people that are using them now continue to see uh, progress, and so you know, will it take hold again the way it did, you know, uh, previously? And so this is an example of that. So um, in the next section, you know, we're going to look at uh, dental abscesses and things like this. But we just want to remind ourselves of a few things, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and do that. So. When we talked about um, caries, we talked about periodontitis and everything, you know, we saw this difference. In the one case, the immune system, you know, with the inflammatory process, you know, really contributes to what happens, you know, the outcome of the, of the infection, you know, as it, as it progresses. And so one of the things that happens in that case, you know, is this inflammatory process that I developed. So I put this slide over here again. So we have antigens that serve as the stimulus. Um, you know, we're going to have you know, uh, uh, antigens to the bacteria in the flat material. Right? This is very different from what happens you know, in the caves with the, uh, in the aciduric environment, you know, where we have the acids being produced you know, from the sucrose and fructose and the metabolism of the acids and so on, where the pH you know, is really low, you know, like five and below. Right? So here with the inflammatory process, you know, we have the immune system kind of aiding along with, you know, what's happening with the pathogenicity. We mentioned LPS, you know, from the gram-negative cells, uh, proteases, you know, capsular material, um, you know, on gram-negative cells especially, you know, we have that LPS, you know, we mentioned. And then we have uh, neutrophils present, right? So in some of the studies that have been done, you know, looking in animal studies, you know, if you had uh, low numbers of the neutrophils, you saw more pathogenicity, you know, if you had neutrophils present, right, that seemed to help with things. And so again, you know, we want to be able to have increased uh, this is polymorphonuclear cells, right, or neutrophils present. And so we already mentioned that for, um, <coughs> excuse me, cells like Pophromonas gingivalis, they can actually produce substances that would inhibit the neutrophils from coming into the area. And so antibodies against, you know, uh, the bacteria, uh, different you know, classes, you know, IgG, IgA, you know, type antibodies, and then of course being able to have the pro-inflammatory cytokines. All of these things, you know, work with the uh, inflammatory process. And if the, the toll-like receptors that would bind to things like the LPS would initiate this signaling that would lead to the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And again, organisms, you know, can provide, um, produce molecules that can clip the IgG, IgA, you know, can destroy them, can destroy complement proteins, any of those things, you know, to prevent being, uh, you know, being killed, uh, being phagocytized, you know, by, uh, by these immune cells. 
<coughs> and so we're going to look at things in some detail uh, after we take a little break. But we want to have just some key features to keep in mind. So I showed you the pictures of the NUMA, you know, last time, you know, with the, 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 the huge uh, uh, destructions that you're seeing around the face and so on. And so, you know, uh, the things that we're going to look at, right, when we have you know, dental abscesses, they can you know, uh, end up being uh, quite severe. Uh, we can have sepsis, death in some cases. We can have, you know, organisms you know, destroy a lot of tissue uh, around the face. In some cases, we can have them, you know, uh, even you know, into the brain. Um, we'll see uh, how these occur. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, secondary to even things like caries uh, or filled, you know, uh, root treatments. And so if we colonize the root canal with bacteria, right, we can begin to see the effects of the products that these organisms uh, producing. And so everything, you know, from pain, swelling, uh, retrieval, etc., uh, can occur. And amongst the organisms that we have, okay, maybe this is polymicrobial, amongst the numbers, some we can culture, some we cannot. So those molecular methods that we discussed, you know, that whole schema that I said we need to know, right, can be applied to um, identification of organisms in cases where we can't grow them, okay? And so uh, we have uh, different groups of organisms, uh, uh, facultative, um, you know, uh, we have uh, anaerobe, we have uh, both you know, rods and uh, coxae, and we've seen some of them already. We have members of the Verdens group we've already seen, and if we look over here, we've encountered, you know, uh, Primotella, Fugobacterium, Popromonas genivalis, and we're adding a new one uh, here. So we have, you know, uh, rather proper modest, uh, species and endotalus, you know, which is associated more, uh, you know, with endotic lesions. And so we will see similarities between the two types of organisms. Again, they're both gram negative, you know, on the plates they will grow, you know, like the black colonies, you know, we looked at on the blood agar plate and everything like this, right? But again, they're different species, which means that they have you know, um, some differences in the way in which, you know, they will uh, cause the pathogenesis and so on. And so when we come back, we'll look at, you know, just take a little break, and then we'll look at the biofilms, kind of remind ourselves, you know, um, how these things form. Then we're going to look at, you know, uh, abscess formation and the conditions associated with that. So in previous slides, right, we had a large, uh, uh, biofilm that we looked at, right, you know, with the fusobacterium as the bridge, okay, so you guys still have those notes, we have bring the image next time, but it's in there, so you want to kind of go back to that one, and just kind of look at it to remind yourself at the bottom, you know, where we have the early colonizers, right, and then we have, you know, the intermediates and then the newcomers, and then we had that bridge, you know, with the fusobacterium, you know, that kind of pulls everybody together, and, um, you know, as we look at stuff today, we want to emphasize what happens, right, with these, you know, uh, strict, you know, obligate anaerobic organisms so that kind of make up the core of the uh, biofilm and, and how we have the interactions that take place in there, okay? So we'll take about five minute break and then, you know, we'll continue uh, with this next section. Any questions? Okay. And so I wanted us to go back to them just to kind of remind. And I mentioned, you know, that uh, slide with the fusobacterium, you know, in the middle and everything, you know, kind of dramatic looking thing that we saw last time. Just, you know, to make sure that we look at that before, you know, we come tomorrow, you know, as we're going to uh, try to find some time to review. But so um, what we're seeing over here is just, you know, the uh, kind of uh, organization that we would have, you know, within the biofilm. And within the biofilms, yes, we have organisms in there, and we have you know, the different uh, characteristics and molecules that they're producing and so on, but then we have what goes on inside the biofilm itself. And so, um, you know, we have cells growing in here, they still have to metabolize, they still have to inter you know, interact you know, with other community members, you know, and so on. And so we have uh, oxygen, uh, levels, uh, nutrient levels that we need to uh, <coughs> kind of consider. And so we keep saying that we find in the center of the biofilm, you know, these obligate anaerobes, 
right? So, you know, again, low to, you know, to non-oxygen within that core, and that's where we typically will find these, you know, um, strict animals, you know, are present. And so, in, um, as, the colony, as the colonies, you know, uh, come in and begin to establish, uh, you know, the biofilm, right? So, we're going to have those that initiate, um, you know, the biofilm. And then we're going to have other organisms come in, you know, around them, so in succession. So we have the early colonizers, we have the you know, intermediate, and we have the late colonizers that come in. And so we're going to have, you know, the slowest of the growers, you know, kind of, you know, in the middle, in the areas where we did the establishment. And in the periphery of the biofilms, you know, we'll have, you know, the faster, faster grower organisms ones that are facultatively uh, anaerobic, facultative, aerobic, to, uh, to uh, ones that we would even consider, you know, um, you know microaerophilic, and even the occasional aerobic obligate that might show up transiently in there, they will be on the outsides, okay? And so what we also have going on in here is, you know, the quorum sensing, the production of substances that uh, can either attract and retain Okay, as well as repel uh, organisms, you know, within uh, the biofilm. And so uh, we notice, you know, in this particular example here, you know, just to show uh, the products that can be uh, uh, secreted uh, or excreted by these organisms, right, can impart uh, this uh, net negative charge that you have on the very peripheries of the biofilm. And uh, so if we have um, uh, antimicrobial, you know, substances, you know, many of, the, many of them have potential to interact with these uh, negatively charged uh, components, you know, in the matrix, you know, and interact with them. But a, a few things inside the, uh, the microfilm. So we will have, okay, again, this quorum sensing, and even in not so direct a situation where we have uh, the quorum sensing taking place, we can have, you know, signaling amongst and between cells. Okay, because again, keep in mind, you know, we want to keep the biofilm established. Uh, any you know, population members that um, you know may cause any kind of adverse effects, you know, to the community, we don't really want. So we want to, have to keep them away. And so we need to be able to do cell-to-cell -cell signaling. You know, uh, have that take place. Um, and the products of the signaling you know, can change the you know the uh, physiology of the of the film. And so it may mean that we have these organisms, you know, producing more substances that cause them to do the adhere tightly and coaggregate. You know, any of those things, you know, could be occurring. And so we'll have, you know, the cells, um, you know, that, um, you know, will kind of persist. You know, the, the numbers will change too much within the biofilm. And then we can also have, you know, a, uh, a great diversity in the types of cells there that we saw in that, you know, image I keep referring you back to. Okay. And so, um, if we think of just the organisms themselves, right, and add in the fact that, you know, we have all this DNA represented, okay, the makeup of the biofilm, right, then, um, you know, that contributes, you know, to the diversity, so in this case, the genetic diversity that we have uh, within. And so, um, if we look a, this, a different way, right? We can have, you know, the matrix, whatever is going to provide, uh, you know, that substrate for the cells to adhere to. So, in the examples we looked at, right, it could be, you know, the uh, pellicle on the tooth, you know, at the beginning place. It could be the lesion, you know, that's already beginning to form, you know, in the, uh, you know, the gingiva, you know, below the gum line, above the gum line. So, wherever the organisms begin to do this, okay. And then, you know, we begin to have them, you know, uh, deposit, they're going to absorb, okay, you know, depending on what's going on, some may go, you know, come off, you know, come back on and so on. And then we begin to have the signaling, which we just talked about, you know, in the previous slide, begin to take place, right? That could contribute to the production of, you know, um, extracellular matrix material that's going to cause cells to aggregate, right? And then we're going to have, you know, again, you know, the uh, nutrients, oxygen, like we just saw, okay, we're going to have a gradient of that. Cells are multiplying, uh, growing, um, you know, being able to establish themselves, you know, within that matrix. 
And then, you know, uh, we begin to see that, right? You know, so depending on how thick the film uh, appears, right? Sometimes, you know, even a thing like brushing might, you know, kick some of them off and then they'll be established again. Okay, depending on the frequency of doing that. So, when we have, you know, uh, this formation of the biofilm going on, right, so we have the microbes aggressively attached to conditioned surfaces, they'll release polysaccharides, proteins, DNA, they'll form extracellular polymeric substances, and, you know, as you get signaling, additional polymers are going to be made um, as the biofilm, you know, uh, occurs, okay? And so, within the mature biofilm, we have a complex, dynamic community. So some organisms, as we saw with the persistent ones, we're going to have those that are going to be there. But then we can have, you know, organisms, you know, move, move around, leave and come back, and so on. And so the, one of the questions I've been asking, you know, um, the last you know, few weeks, is just trying to see, okay, this is globally, this is how people are studying these things, right? So do we have common core organisms that, regardless of where you are geographically, in the biofilms, in the mouth, for example, you're going to always find. And then, you know, by geographic region, you know, we do now see variations, okay, depending on what, what's being eaten, you know, what's, you know, what you're drinking, etc. you know, the source of the sugars and all these different things that are going to keep the organisms in there. And so, some of this information that we've been going over, right, has been obtained by investigators looking into these type of things. And so, you know, uh, you know, I mentioned to you, you know, the, uh, the little chip that can be inserted into the mouth, you know, the volunteers, um, and part of what they have to do is not, you know, brush teeth, you know, no antimicrobial rinses, whatever, for a period of time. And then they'll collect those chips back and then they'll, you know, examine them to see, you know, what, you know, what, what grows. Um, you know, they'll also check, you know, DNA as well to see, you know, uh, assuming things didn't grow, right, can they tell, you know, from the amount of DNA, uh, the types that you're seeing, you know, to get a sense of the different that represented. And so again, you know, uh, these differences are important to know because if you have intervention, right, you know, should you be using things that should work no matter where? Or do you have to target your interventions, you know, depending on what geographic region you happen to be. So okay, this is one of the things that you find, you know, people doing. And so you have, you know, um, heterogeneity, okay, you know, in the metabolic activities that you have, you have different types of interactions that take place, you have the aggregates that form, and we've already talked about this, you know, um, you know, we can exchange DNA, we have communication with the signaling that takes place and so on within these biofilms. So if we just back up over here, um, again, I just want to make a point. Let's see. Right. So uh, one of the things that you notice over here, uh, in two places, right? So over here, you know, where you have the desorption going on, and then over here, you know, over here where you have the detachment, you know, and erosion, sloughing, etc. So again, you know, these two places, you know, offer. The, uh, the chances, you know, to get new members of the populations, you know, to show up. I mean, detach, new organisms come in, if they, you know, if they're able to uh, stay within, you know, the film, then we can have them, you know, kind of as, as established, you know, and continue, uh, even as late arrivals, you know, to the, you know, to the community. So we have those two places, you know, where we can have uh, those kind of changes uh, taking place. All right, so um, other things to kind of think about, so once we have the organisms, you know, uh, established, right, um, the biofilm you know, is very tough to get antimicrobial agents to penetrate uh, into those areas where you have, you know, the strict anaerobes growing. And so that extracellular polymetrics, you know, a matrix that's formed, you know, kind of helps to, you know, impede this, you know, entry or access of uh, antimicrobial agents, you know, to the center. And so you have a number of things that are done. Um, so if, if you think in terms of what we've talked about with the caries and, you know, having the plaque form and so on, right, the removal of the plaque essentially is the remo removal of the biofilm. So physically you can, you know, you, you, can, you can do that. 
uh, you know, when you have the antimicrobial rinses being used, you know, as part of the treatment uh, process, the same idea is to reduce the number of bacteria, trying to prevent, you know, their reestablishment, you know, and forming the biofilms all over again or repairing the biofilms, as, as the case may be. Um, so you have, you know, UV uh, uh, light that's used. Uh, antibiotics themselves directly can be given, you know, to uh, kill the, uh, the bacteria. And so again, the difficulty is penetrating, you know, into that uh, center of the of the biofilm, and you know, without physical means. So with physical means, you can scrape things off, you know, to reduce, uh, you know, the uh, the cells and everything. But you know, by just treating alone, that may not be sufficient to get rid of the whole uh, biofilm. And so. Things that can uh, make it even more difficult, um, you know, when there are implants uh, or any kind of prosthetic devices, you know, in, in, in our case, you know, in the oral cavity, uh, because those provide substrates for the, you know, bacteria to uh, essentially uh, land on and begin to establish uh, the biofilms over there. In other parts of the body, you know, where we have uh, catheters and things like this inserted, those are also places where we can see biofilm development. And those become, again, really difficult, you know, to, uh, to remove, um, you know, without actually physically changing and, you know, having new catheters inserted and things like that. You know, very difficult to get those biofilms uh, removed. And again, if you have a bacteria growing there in large numbers, right, that can, you know, lead to, uh, you know, to illness. And what can also happen is that depending on where you have the uh, biofilms established. When you go to remove them, as the bacteria, you know, kind of leave the biofilm, they can contaminate surfaces. They can contaminate, you know, uh, in this case, you know, water. They can contaminate, you know, other parts of the of the body and so on. And so that can now end up, you know, being a, a problem because then now you're spreading the bacteria from the localized area of the biofilms to other areas of the of the body. And so we already mentioned that, you know, we can have the cells communicate, you know, uh, in a density dependent manner using this quorum sensing. And so, again, you know, the cells are producing molecules that, you know, uh, other cells are responding to. And um, again, you know, these can um, lead to recruitment of cells, increasing, you know, the level of replication that you have, uh, having, you know, more numbers and so on. And again, if you want to do that, all the different things we've talked about can, you know, can occur. You know, the exchange of the genetic material, et cetera, all of those things can take place, okay? Uh, one of the things that the cells can also produce are these uh, bactericins uh, within the population, within the, uh, within the biofilms again. And so it's not just recruitment of cells that's important, but also keeping away cells that are not wanted that's important. One molecule, uh, that's been uh, looked at uh, that's important for gram-negative organisms is this, you know, uh, acyl homocerine lactone, and it's an auto-inducer a molecule, and so it can you know, be diffused across the plasma membrane, and so, you know, once it's out of the cells within the environment, it can actually target, uh, you know, the genes within the cells, and has you know multiple functions, you know, everything from increasing you know, signaling to affecting you know the way in which cells you know uh, grow and you know, utilize nutrients and metabolize so a whole variety of factors in there. And so um, you know other than just this particular molecule over here and just the general sense of knowing that this happens, um, this table over here is just you know shown as an example of um, you know molecules that can, that can be produced and uh, can be used by cells, you know, in a variety of ways. Uh, everything, you know, from having, you know, virulence uh, molecules, you know, and so on, right, to uh, aiding uh, a transfer of material between cells. So we just want to know this one, again, because we've been dealing with all these gram-negative cells. Um, you know, so remember all the, uh, the triponema, the you know, porphyromonas, you know, the Tanarella, all these things that we've been talking about, these are all gram-negative organisms. And, you know, pretty much, you know, uh, strict anaerobes. And so we just kind of want to remember a uh, molecule that's important in you know, gram-negative cells. But the table just kind of gives you, you know, an uh, illustration of the fact that there are many 
more, and, it, it, and by no means is this even a complete table. So we want to look at um, endodontic infections and kind of you know, compare them to what we've said with uh, caries and also you know, what we've said with uh, periodontitis and everything. And I just want to kind of re-emphasize the point that we've already made several times, that in all these cases, you know, we're looking at uh, polymicrobial uh, infections. And so we can single out, you know, um, you know, a handful of organisms and say, okay, we always see these ones, right? But then we can, you know, if we, if we and, and this is what the studies do, there are, you know, large uh, studies, and if you look in the literature, and I, I hope at some point when you guys have time, you know, just for interest sake, you just kind of look at this. But, you know, one of the things, you know, that um, people have been doing is, you know, they will, you know, they will collect, you know, in the studies, um, you know, black material, you know, from uh, enrolled, you know, uh, study members, and pretty much, you know, compare, okay, you know, um, the type of organisms that they're isolating and identifying from this material. And in some cases, you know, they're doing the comparisons, you know, based on what other conditions the, you know, the individuals you know, might have, you know, ongoing other chronic uh, uh, diseases and things like this. And they will, you know, in some of the cases, they're checking before treatment and after treatment and the duration of the treatment to see, you know, uh, what recolonization looks like if it does occur. Okay. And so, what you know, again, they're noticing is that you know, in some of the cases, yes, you know, when they look at, um, you know, uh, periodontitis, they'll see the porphyrmonas gingivalis. Okay, it's present. You know, they'll see it. They look at you know juvenile uh, cases, you know pediatric cases, and so on. You know, you know they'll see, it. and then when they have those aggressive you know situations, you know right? We mentioned the uh, Avicanobacter uh, genus, you know that we saw there. So we have to keep reminding ourselves that you know we don't have a single solitary organism that is responsible for uh, you know for caries lesions, you know, or for periodontitis and so on, right? We can have, we have those keystone pathogens that are there, but then we have the other organisms, you know, that uh, co-infect and co-infect with them. And at that point, is really important to keep in mind. And so uh, here, you know, so the things that we want to kind of look at, right, you know, I mean, how uh, endodontic infections different from the other two that we've talked about. And so we have a focal infection theory uh, that's you know, being used to refer to this type of infection. We have dental abscesses, you know, that can occur. Um, you know, failed treatments can happen, and in those cases, you know, organisms that um, are found may be different from the ones that were found the first time. So that's also important to keep in mind. Um, we kind of want to also understand, like we've done for the other ones. Okay, so we mentioned. Streptococcus, you know, uh, Gordoni and mutants and so on. What, you know, are the major organisms we can find here, okay? And what do the biofilms look like here compared to the ones that we've already talked about? And we also want to see how oral bacteria can influence systemic infections uh, in other parts of the body. And in situations where we have both, you know, uh, parentitis and endotoxic infection going at the same time, right, you know, how do people think about that? Okay, and so I mentioned to you that, you know, again, it's not every case that comes in that you want to prescribe an antibiotic for, right? Or you want to, you know, isolate organisms and grow in plates and try to identify, you know, a particular bacteria and so on. But the severity of the infection may be such that, you know, to really try to control things, antibiotics may be prescribed along with everything else that's being done. And so we'll see you know, some of those examples. And then, you know, um, we want to look at enteric uh, bacteria, again, representatives, you know, the gram-negative organisms, just like we did with the gram-positives with the staph and the strep. And so, again, we'll look at those examples, you know, just to get uh, an understanding of the exotoxins, you know, that are produced and the effects that they may have. And in particular, you know, we're going to look at strains of E. coli uh, for this. But in any case, so this is you know, the study and treatment of diseases of dental pulp. And so uh, you know, Lamont you know, and others, you know, the author of the text that was uh, originally being used you know, for this course, 
right, uh, and also states this. And so we have this uh, direct cause-effect relationship, you know, for disease that we can describe in other places, but for here, it is not very clear, okay? Again, because, you know, um, of the different things that can happen, you know, uh, once, you know, we're manipulating things inside the mouth. And so, you know, organisms, you know, from root canals have been known for a very long time. Okay, decaying teeth and all of that. So, um, you know, in all of human history, you know, with the you know, introduction of uh, agriculture and, you know, being able to grow foods, you know, uh, starchy foods and all of this, you know, with sugar available, ever since that started to happen, you know, uh, the association has been made with, you know, problems with the teeth. And so, um, you know, Willoughby Miller, okay, that I mentioned uh, to you uh, before, so, you know, he worked in uh, the lab of uh, Robert Koch, right, the postulates we talked about, and we kind of remember those. So we don't want to forget the postulates, right? Okay. So he worked in that lab, you know, culturing bacteria from endodontic lesions. So this is something that, you know, has been, you know, been going on for a while. And so the idea then when you have bacteria infecting, um, you know, uh, root canals, you know, the, the teeth and everything was to try to preserve the tooth, okay? And so even today, that's the first thing, okay? You know, to try to see, okay, should we you know, preserve the tooth? Sometimes, you know, you can't, okay? In which case, you know, the, the, the tooth has to be removed or the teeth have to be removed because of how extensive, you know, the, the damage already is. And so, because of the nature of the microbial populations that you have, you know, in these uh, infected, you know, canals and so on, uh, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, that pretty much, you know, you treat uh, the area the way you would treat a wound. You want to get, you know, the organisms cleaned out, and then you want to manage the area, and then you want to see if you can restore health again, right? But again, sometimes, you know, the treatment fails, and you can't really uh, save the tooth. So, cauterization of the exposed dental pulp is one, you know, and what used to be done, you know, which you know, is now changed, you know, once you did that, you know, then you would have to fill the canal with something. And so that was you know, used until it was clear that that was not uh, something that was, you know, uh, good to do. And so, you know, these days other things are done again, you know, in the interest of saving the tooth or teeth. So, when the tooth is decayed, and again, as a result of the you know, microbial infection, right, it's considered a dead tooth. And so, you know, the focus of infection uh, theory, uh, you know, that we have, you know, uh, uh, came from uh, William Hunter. So again, you know, you're treating this localized thing, you have all this, you know, microbial infection going on, and you want to do something about it, okay? And so, part of the problem is that you know, when you have you know, the high number of bacteria that you have in there, the diverse amounts that you can, in some cases, not, not every time, the danger is having the bacteria spread from there to other places, okay? Uh, in a way that's a little different from the things that we've talked about. And so, um, again, in most cases, by the time you know, anything got done, the teeth were already so bad that they had to be removed. And so we have these, you know, situations of the 100 percenters where everything you know, essentially was taken out. Okay, and there are some cases today where even that it is still done. Okay, you know, so there's individuals suspended with dentures, you know, all dentures you know, uh, upper, uh, upper and lower, and you know, uh, the old natural teeth are all gone. So we have the dental pulp tissue is where we're focused on, you know, uh, trying to understand how the bacteria are getting in here, and so the bacteria that are found, um, you know, uh, ones that we associate with the normal flora, and so again, if you remember the first uh, day of class, we had mentioned, you know, opportunistic, you know, trying to define what opportunistic organisms are. So we can have, you know, more than normal flora, ones that are opportunistic pathogens, and um, some of the early studies, you know, had looked at wanting to find out how colonization takes place. And so you had these studies, you know, with germ-free rats, just like you could do with germ-free uh, mice. And so um, when you had the public you know, exposure in those individuals, no infection. But then when you had you know, conventional uh, animals that had the oral bacteria, 
they had infection taking place. And they had inflammation, they had necrosis, they had some of the, all the hallmarks that we just mentioned. Okay? And so again, what that's saying is that you know, the normal flora that you have there as part of you know, the oral microbiome, you have organisms in there that can initiate these infections um, you know, within the heart. And so you needed to have you know, some kind of a confirmation of the organism uh, types. And again, just like we saw with the postulates, you know, and again, have a confirmation that indeed the organisms you were finding there were the ones that were causing you know, the infection that was being found and so on. And one of the you know, conclusions that came out of that was that we have complex polymicrobial infections, kind of similar to what we've seen with uh, peritonitis and so on. And so um, we have this statement over here by uh, <coughs> Dr. Grossman, who is considered the father of modern endodontics. And uh, so what he has here is that root canals could be debrided to the point where culture samples of the breeded root canal could no longer detect viable bacteria. So again, back to the wound um, you know, analogy. Really. So you're cleaning, you're trying to eliminate. And if you go back and you culture from there, the point is you should show that you don't have any more cells growing. Okay? And that can be hard to do, depending on what's going on uh, in the mouth. And so when we think about, you know, um, the total burden of infection within individuals, and you know, if you have uh, infections, you know, of this type, they essentially contribute to whatever else is going on in the body. Because again, we have that immune system involvement. We have the inflammation that we're going to see, and so we have this constant presence, you know, of, of uh, antigen response to the system, and that cycle that we looked at, you know, in one of the slides, you know, with the integrated uh, diagram. And so if inflammation continues, then the potential for systemic disease becomes, you know, uh, it becomes really uh, important. And in individuals who are immunocompromised or if they have other chronic um, diseases, this can become, you know, a problem. So the risks for complications, um, you know, when we have these kind of infections, head and neck infections, the systemic infections we already talked about. Um, you know, we can have life-threatening situations if we have organisms, you know, invade, you know, uh, the brain. And so again, you know, if we have uh, individuals with, uh, with other infections, you know, the immune compromised, have other chronic infections, those can affect the way in which the endodontic infections can be managed. And so we have things such as diabetes, you know, type two, viral genetic diseases. Uh, other gene polymorphisms, uh, you know, occur and as well. We saw this, you know, with the pregnantitis, um, smoking, you know, um, and uh, poor oral uh, health and poor oral hygiene associated with that in some cases can also uh, be a factor. So just things to keep in mind. And so if we um, have, you know, breaches, you know, in the enamel, uh, dentin layer, sometimes the tooth or teeth uh, crack, you have fractures, Right? Uh, any of those type of things, you know, can uh, initiate a process. And, you know, we can get bacteria into those areas and so on. Okay? So, in the way in which this has been done, very different from the theories, you know, and uh, uh, that we talked about, right? You still want to get numbers of bacteria down, but you're not here really thinking about how much acid is being produced by the bacteria. Right, and, uh, and how much that is, you know, sitting on the enamel of the tooth and so on. So it's a different, um, a different uh, strategy. So you want to reduce bacteria. Um, you know, if, if you have uh, one isolated tooth that you're dealing with, then you're dealing with that one tooth. If it's more than one, then it's, you know, the few that are, you know, that are involved. And so again, uh, in this situation, it might become necessary to actually look for the bacteria. So you might culture, you know, the infected root canals, find out, you know, by gram stain what organisms you have, you know, you have there, and you know, really uh, try to even speciate to know uh, what you have. And so a number of things uh, have to be in place. So um, you know, there has to be a source of infection, right? 
So where is the bacteria coming from to get into the root canal? So it can be from already existing uh, carious lesions, uh, periodontal lesions, damage you know, from dental treatments, uh, just regular you know, wear and tear, um, you know, which can uh, result in things like you know, uh, teeth uh, cracking and so on. Um, you know, so you can also have you know, bacteria systematic from other sources within the oral cavity, right? You know, so uh, also uh, occur. Amongst those organisms, so the streptococci group, lactobacillus group, you know, can be found in the dental uh, tubules. And if you have already that cycle that we discussed, you know, with the mineralization, demineralization, have that process already begin, uh, we're already, you know, um, affecting the dentin, we can begin to colonize those areas as well. The bacteria can come from there. Uh, we can also uh, have other things occur. So, you know, again, uh, anaerobic metabolism, right, with all the enzymes being produced, we already mentioned the cracks, you know, in the enamel, loss of cementum. We can have bacteria forced into these places. So then when this happens, we can colonize, we can begin to multiply, and, you know, uh, we can have the bacteria seeded in areas where we already have inflammation, right? Anachoresis, you know, uh, will occur, we have all this bacteria, and the bacteria will occur. And, you know, even in areas where you have surgical and non-surgical trauma in patients, right? There's going to be uh, places for the source. Toothbrushing, flossing, any of those things that can distribute the bacteria. Okay, will be places where you can get uh, the bacteria uh, from. And, um, you know, if we have the bacteria, you know, forced into, uh, you know, neighboring areas of the teeth, okay, all of those, you know, we can again colonize, we can multiply, and eventually we can begin to see a pathogenic activity, okay. And so again, you notice we haven't mentioned a single organism, uh, you know, by, by name, you know, no genus species just have the group of the streptococci and the lactobacillus. So, you know, again, in addition to that here, we can have other types of organisms here, okay, which is why we mentioned the protozoans, right, so that we still remember Antiliva gingivalis and Trichomonas tenax. Okay, so those, in these studies I keep describing to you, looking at geographic, you know, uh, cases, right, sometimes, you know, you find these uh, protozoans in there more, more, more than the bacteria that you will find in other areas, okay? And so we can culture the ones that can be grown <coughs> in the Pula media, and then the ones that we cannot, right? We have the DNA uh, molecular methods for identifying them. So here's a you know, group of organisms. So when the bacteria have been cultured, okay, from these uh, endodontic lesions, right? You have these anaerobic bacteria, and some of these we've already seen before, right? So the Fusobacterium, everybody remember those ones, you know, the Frigotella, the you know, species we have those, the Frigotella intermedia. Uh, you know, we have Pavimonas, uh, et cetera, right, the Alista. All of these, you know, uh, are found, these can be cultured. Molecular detection, you know, picks up a bunch more, and in particular we have the Eubacterium species. Okay, which is one of the biofilms, you know, the B and the you know, outer portion, you know, of those. And then uh, in symptomatic lesions, okay, you know, again, you know, these are popular infections, um, you know, the diversity wasn't as high as, you know, one would have uh, normally thought about. And so again, you know, in those, right, uh, fusobacterium, same things we find over here, the dialysis, the Prigotella, eubacterium, but in particular, right, the Porphyromonas that we've mentioned, right, so remember Porphyromonas gingivalis, we talked about a lot, okay? But then we have this other species, this uh, endototalis over here, right? So you get to differentiate it from uh, gingivalis that is found more associated, okay, with the endotonic lesions compared to Porphyromonas gingivalis, okay? So uh, questions about this, you know, the kind of things, you know, that um, you could be asked, Okay, we'll be to make sure that we recognize these two organisms here, okay? So, it, we've, we've had lists and groups of organisms and all whatnot, right? And when we looked at the experiment that kind of defined, you know, the red complex, orange complex, other kind of this, the green complex, all that, 
we said we wanted to focus on that red complex. Okay, so here we know we know about the other organisms there, but at least here for a class like this, we want to make sure we know what's going on in that red complex. Right? And so the rest of the organisms that we had on there, right? If you remember that slide I'm talking about, with the orange, you know, the green, the purple, and all of this the yellow, is to remind us that we have all of those organisms that we can find in there, right? But then you know the keystone. Uh, pathogen in that case, right? We had the Buffaloonas gingivalis and the Tanarella, right? And the uh, Everybody kind of see how this works out? Okay. All right. So we want to remember these two, right here. Okay. And again, looking at the fungal uh, infections, other things were found. So we have Enterococcus picalis. Okay, that was uh, seen, you know, 75% among the cultured, you know, bacteria in there. Uh, facultative anaerobic gram-positive organisms. So everything else we've been kind of uh, mentioning, you know, we had the streptococcus, you know, group that was gram-positive, right? And then we mentioned the gram-negative, you know, obligate anaerobes uh, as well. So here we have these, um, you know, gram-positive uh, cocci. And so, you know, the enteric, uh, commensal organisms, you know, from food products, and so the idea is how would they get in there, and so you know, between visits, so if you know if you have a procedure ongoing, you know, people at home, you know, depending on what they're eating, drinking, organisms can gain access from there. So you know, between uh, uh, visits, you know, for the, the therapy that's going on, new organisms can be introduced, and they could find themselves, you know, within uh, those lesions. And once they get in there, they can persist. Um, so things that you know will happen, you know, resistant high temperature, pH, and other things can increase you know the um, you know, the status of the organisms in there. And so the Porphyromonas species, uh, Bribotella, again most commonly uh, isolated. Okay. So the studies are showing that, but again we don't want to forget that we're dealing with these you know polymicrobial situations, and depending on what kind of treatment is going on. The diversity, the numbers and types of organisms could be high or, or not. Okay. And so uh, in terms of the phyla represented by these organisms, you know, uh, isolated from the endodontic lesions, right, uh, is what's shown over here. So we talked about the four major phyla. Everybody kind of remember that, right? We talked about the Firmicutes, the Actinobacteria, the Proteobacteria, and the Bacteroides right here. But then we have these other phyla that are, uh, that are found, okay? And uh, we see examples of the organisms represented within this phyla. So again, the point is, right, um, in much the same way that we can talk about with uh, periodontic lesions, we can find some diversity here, you know, more than just the four represented. But not forgetting that the four phyla still represent the major phyla that we have of the organisms that we have in the microbiome, both in the GI and in the mouth. Okay, so the, your questions, you know, are going to want to make sure that we, we remember that. Okay, and so this TM7 over here is one of these newly identified phyla. So you know, we talked about the fact that not all, you know, the organisms that are identified in the oral microbiome can be cultured, right? So a good, you know, half of them cannot. And so uh, one of the organisms, you know, uh, that was identified and characterized by molecular methods kind of fell out of the known phyla. And so we have this, you know, new uh, TM7 phyla. And then, you know, the organism that was of interest that was found, you know, uh, in here to begin the investigation that led to its categorization as a new phylum, uh, showed that uh, you had a co-existing organisms that were dependent on each other, okay? And so tomorrow we'll probably make a little mention of that. But in any case, this is what has led to um, the interest in saying if you find organisms that uh, are interdependent, and if you can identify them, if you eliminate one member, then you will in the same uh, instance eliminate the dependent organism, okay? And so there's a lot of interest in this TM7 group right here. Okay, so again, the you know, what we're looking at here is, you know, the phyla that were most represented 
in the organisms identified from uh, root canal uh, infections. Right? So uh, this is what this is represented. And these are the four that we said, you know, the majority of the organisms fall under these. Okay? So we're remembering not just the, you know, the names of the phyla, but also the gram reaction of them. So we want to know which ones are positive, which ones are negative, and so on. Okay, and we've seen this before, just kind of reminding us that again, we have, you know, many different phyla, right? But we have the majority, okay, again, within this group right here. All right, so a little bit of differences in, uh, in, you know, in how to think about these organisms that we find. So in, uh, in necrotic pulp, uh, decreased vascular circulation, decreased immunity, uh, okay, a lot of microorganisms. Uh, you know, so we have those that are you know, non-pathogenic, we have aggregates, we have biofilms that are formed. And so we have resistance to disinfection and antimicrobial agents, remember what we said, you know, in the core with these obligate, you know, anaerobes that are there, you know, real difficult, you know, to, uh, to get after them, the antimicrobial agents, physical activities needed mechanically to remove, you know, the, the growth. And we have these uh, sulfur granules, and these are bacterial uh, clumps that contain uh, actinomyces, okay, that have been recognized. And so, uh, again, if we look generally from what we know now, right, uh, we have the obligate anaerobes, gram-negative organisms, okay, here they are. So the porphyromonas, Prevotella, Tanarella, all of these, you know, gram-negative organisms, they, you know, they differ um, uh, morphologically. We have, you know, the rods, and we have focal bacillary forms, we have the, you know, the uh, spirochete uh, types over here, and so on. We have uh, obligate anaerobic, you know, gram-positive cells, right? The gamella uh, species, Pravimonas, Actinomyces, and then we have the facultative anaerobic gram-positive organisms, right? Of which we have, you know, the Streptococcus species, okay, that we looked at, mutants, mitis, the you know, you know, that whole thing, and uh, we have the Enterococcus vicalis, uh, Actinomyces over here, staph, okay, that we looked at. And then we have, you know, the facultative anaerobic, you know, gram negative, okay, not to be confused with the group up here, which is strict anaerobes. And so then here we have the agrigatobacter, uh, we have, uh, you know, helicobacter pylori, right, that was also identified. And so remember what we said, you know, this was a big surprise, because, you know, this is associated with uh, sites in the duodenum, but, you know, it was also you know, found uh, you know, in the oral uh, cavity. And then we have the aerobes, you know, gram positive organisms, and then again, you know, representation, you know, the back of these uh, communities and so on. So, again, uh, we have a lot of different organisms, you know, it's, it's what this is, but we know ones to kind of key in on. So, when we mention Porphyromonas gingivalis, we all have some ideas in our, in our minds as to what that organism is, right? Everything to the you know, black colonies that we saw on the blood agar okay, and everything like that. Again, keeping in mind that that's not the only organism that causes black pigmented you know, colonies, right? But in this case, we just want to make sure that we have a full picture of this, you know, gram negative blood, you know, non motile black colonies on, uh, on the blood agar, you know, strict anaerobe, and all of those things. So we have some characteristics we can actually use to identify. And then we also mentioned the other thing, virulence factors for those strains, you know, that we have uh, the pathogenic, we mentioned the ginger pains, we remember those things, we mentioned, you know, the production of the collagenases, uh, you know, being able to disrupt, you know, toll like receptor 2 interactions, you know, all of these things, you know, uh, reduce uh, the recruitment of neutrophils, and so we have all these virulence factors that make uh, popular models in the balance, you know, the pathogenic strains pretty important. So, which means if we saw those characteristics, we can actually identify them. And we went also so far as to mention that we have the fimbriae, right? With the, you know, fimbriae, we mentioned the examples that are used to interact with streptococcus badoni. So, um, when we're thinking about those things, we're trying to remember those. And so, we'll look at, you know, this and then we'll stop. And so, um, you know, we have within these biofilms resistance to antimicrobial agents. 
we have quorum sensing, either we can recruit or repel. And you know, those particular phenotypes that are you know, resistant, right, they can persist. Okay, remember the first diagram we looked at where you saw the persisters, you know, right there, you know, in the middle of the biofilm, but we can persist within there. And uh, so, and if we do that, then we have the virulence of molecules that are produced, and we've encountered some of these already. So we mentioned the endotoxins, you know, the you know, LPS, the collagenase, uh, hyaluronidase, you know, the cystine pyrimidases, all of these things that confer virulence. And uh, we have inflammatory responses, you know, the pulp cells, and then we have the, you know, the cytokines and chemokines that can be produced, you know, that have, uh, you know, as a result of inflammatory response. And the major cells that are recruited as a result of these uh, chemokines, neutrophils, um, you know, can have macrophages. And so again, you know, when we have them within here, right? Um, if we're unchecked you know, with the growth that's occurring, then we can, you know, begin to lead to uh, bone destruction. So some of the substances that the bacteria are producing will encourage, you know, the bone, the bone damage that takes place. And so when we come back tomorrow, we're going to look at the abscesses, we're going to see, uh, you know, how these common on the systemic uh, infections. And then in particular, we're going to look at uh, a couple of uh, case studies, just to kind of highlight the things that we've been talking about. And so, um, and then, you know, we have in here also um, the gram-negative cells that we're going to look at and finish up things, and then I'm hoping that we can do some review. We're writing uh, Pieno and Paulus and Proclamation Dallas. Because we just need to know which one is involved in periodontal versus and the, the predominance, problem. right? So yeah. you can find both, right? And when we first, you know, kind of looked at a little more detail of uh, performance, we said that it's not only found in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, we find the respiratory system, we find the rectal tract, right? But you know, the predominance, you know, we're looking at the infection in the mouth, right? You can distinguish uh, the two species. Is there anything else that we should know about that? Or just, just so the characteristics we just talked about, like I just listed you know, the characteristics. So we need to know, again, you know, gram reaction, morphology, uh, oxygen requirements, and that's the kind of stuff we're going to review tomorrow. So those, you know, those uh, three members of the red complex, you know, we want to know for sure, okay, you know, what are they, uh, right? And then for the gram positive organisms, the strep and the staph that we talked about, we want to know, you know, um, again, the facultative, you know, anaerobes. We want to know which ones are producing catalase, coagulase, right, that whole business we talked about, and which ones are producing the, uh, the smolacins, right, with the hemolytic activity on the blood agar plates and so on. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll review all of that tomorrow, just to make sure we're keeping the different groups together. Right. Okay. Any questions? Okay, everybody kind of clear how this is going? Okay. And so, you know, so again, that, you know, uh, one slide that has the big biofilm, okay, we want to kind of look at that again. You know, pretty much just remember when we established the biofilm with all those strep species, right, you know, what are the molecules they were laying down, okay, all the way until we get the bacterial species that kind of hold the early colonizers and the late colonizers, you know, together in the biofilm. Okay. And so the other things that we had talked about, you know, so, the culturing conditions, you know, that we looked at, you know, how we measure and count the cells. And um, so, and the, 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 here's the thing. So, you know, sometimes you say, okay, well, you know, in a class like this, you know, why do we really still need to know about, you know, culture in the cells and all these different characteristics and everything? Well, it wouldn't really make sense, you know, if you don't remember that part, why somebody would be isolated flat from 300 patients or whatever and then try to find out what organisms, are, you know, are found in there. They're going to still do basic microbiology. They're going to get out of the plates, they're going to streak them out, you know, incubate them, and then do the gram staining, you know, and then begin to find out, okay, what do we have to learn here? Uh, this, you know, part of their uh, readout, you know, reports would be, you know, uh, describing the colonies they're seeing on the plates, you know, by size, pigmentation, texture, all of those things that you do in the standard microbiology environment. And then from that point on, then you can do all the fancy microbial stuff and everything like that. And then if you 
can't grow them then directly from the plant. You want to isolate DNA. Okay? And the DNA that you isolate, you know, may represent you know, hundreds of other ones. And so if you're doing, you know, the PCR and things like this, right, you can easily identify the DNA that belongs to different uh, type of organisms when you do the blood search. And that's why we wanted to make sure that scheme that we had of how you do that, okay, that we all remember the steps in the right order. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll come back tomorrow, we'll finish this up, and then we'll do